Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage, I thought we'd do a little straightforward vlog and chat about the future of our beloved Jaguar. Well, you find me working away from home in Jazzy, my uh, IH630RL panel van conversion. So I'm not in my garage and I can't play with my Jags, but I fancied chatting with some of you guys, because I've got nobody else here to chat with, about Jaguar generally and the future of Jaguar. Regulars know that I don't do clickbait or false drama, so let me get straight out of the way at the front end. I have no insider knowledge. I have done lots of work uh, in and around Jaguar and its suppliers over the years, but not for many years. So I view this um, as an enthusiast. First thing I wanted to chat about for a couple of minutes was in the news recently, there has been news that allegedly Jaguar is going to be sold off, spun off from JLR to a maybe Chinese automaker. And people are getting a little bit hysterical about this. A, we don't know if it'll happen. B, it might be the best thing ever to happen to Jaguar. And C, if you're worried about it being a Chinese company, remember that currently Jaguar is owned by Tata, making it technically an Indian company. Prior to that, it was owned for a while by Premier Automotive Group, or Ford, making it an American company. And it's been under many other bigger banners than Jaguar for many, many years, even if you look at the British ones like British Leyland. So to address the patriotic angle from my side, I wouldn't have any issues at all with Jaguar being owned by a Chinese automaker. If that Chinese car maker had got the money and investment to make Jaguar strong, then that sounds like an entirely good thing. I would like to think that they would try and retain what is great about Jaguar, its heritage, it's primarily UK manufacturing base and its approach to go in niche its own way and not trying to just create a more successful BMW 5 Series and 7 Series or insert your own brand of choice that's well regarded. I think what's made Jaguar great over the years and then probably exposes their, their weaker moments for the same reasons, is Jaguars are genuinely different. They plough a slightly different furrow to what people might think of as their competitors. So if we look at Audi, BMW, Mercedes and their most closely relatable products to things in the Jaguar range of maybe 15 years ago. Why were the Jaguars different? Um, they were never trying to be as overtly Nürburgring as BMW always seemed to try to be. BMW liked the tagline, the ultimate driving machine. And I think some of the associations with that are about very crisp handling rear wheel drive. Um, but they're also associated with lap records and ragging a car within an inch of its life and hard suspension and zero lean. Jaguars have always been high performance. There are very few models and trim levels, in fact, within the Jaguar back catalogue, which you would say were slow or bad handling cars. You look at other competitors like Mercedes, and Mercedes have never really been in the same park as BMW. 
they make some fabulous cars with excellent performance some really outrageous stuff but if you think about their heritage and what they're well known for and look at the whole range of the vehicles wind back a few years then the association is with the perception of luxury quality and insulation from the road so whilst bmw might be a little bit more edgy and harsh mercedes would be insular and serene jaguar managed to find that niche and they've had this niche going right back to the years of the ss branded cars where they were sporting carriages they could outperform most vehicles on the road but not the truly exotic and exceptional and they were far more luxurious than the majority of vehicles on the road except for the exotic and the exceptional and the reason that i am so enamored with jaguars as cars take the heritage out of it is I don't think there is anything else that you can jump into that is going to give the same combination of tactile build quality, i.e. the touch surfaces feel great, look great, smell great, with sporting feel in that they handle beautifully and they perform amazingly, and yet they cosset you from a ride point of view and a transmission point of view. And I've never really competed with anything from Vauxhall or Ford particularly, but equally they're not trying to be Lamborghini or Ferrari or Bugatti. They're occupying that niche middle ground that is attainable, sporting, luxurious and with the perception of really good quality all wrapped in some of the best bodywork and interior styling that anybody has ever produced so they truly are niche some might say that the, the most direct comparison is aston martin after all there's a couple of models of Jaguar and Aston Martin which share more than a little bit of DNA. But Aston Martin charge a lot more. They have some spectacularly good engines. And again, the styling is really good. But they're trading on very low volume and bespokeness at a level which Jaguar had never tried to get to. But with that high cost, that bespokeness, that higher emphasis on handmade, which is a strange concept. Um, you are looking at a lower volume vehicle that has not been productionized to the same degree, which you can see if you're interested in one as a huge bonus, or if you're not so interested in Aston Martins as a negative not as many of the wrinkles have been ironed out in your typical Aston Martin compared to your typical Jaguar of 10 years ago. So Jags are unique. And I think as long as the current owners or any new owners retain that unique angle of reasonable volume, much smaller than the big volume badges, your Fords, your Vauxhalls, your Nissans, uh, and their German competitors in the, exec in the executive world. But they don't try to go to the super exotica of Bugatti and Koenigsegg. Then that's fine by me. I want their products to be attainable and desirable. Now, there have been a couple of examples in the past where Jaguar has tried to increase its scale, increase its volumes, and really tap into the mass market. And I guess the most uh, well-known and notorious 
for the wrong reasons of these has been the Jaguar X-Type. Now, I'm not going to hear anything bad said about the X-Type. The X-Type is a very good car. End of story. Does it match in with the rest of the Jaguar products that preceded it? Probably not. Probably not. But it did at least still produce cars that were quicker than the average. Better handling than the average. Better trimmed than the average. But the engineering behind it was almost entirely borrowed from a Ford in this particular case. And what they got was a car that was actually quite a sales success and brought in some new clients, a lot of them being people who um, wanted a company car but couldn't stretch to Jags in the true sense of the word. All of a sudden, the X-Type brought it within their reach. We'll have one of those, please. But unfortunately, that mass market that they were going after, and I'm sure they would have liked to sell as many X-Types as three series were sold, the Jag styling and image didn't appeal to a young enough audience to open up the group of people who are going to buy that car wide enough. It wasn't Ford RSE. It wasn't BMW 3 Series like. And that's what a younger audience was drawn towards whereas the Jaguar looked more mature and more sensible. And so it did rather well, but it didn't give them that explosion that they hoped for. In my opinion, that's because they didn't manage to target a more youthful audience, and it wasn't core Jaguar enough to really create the buzz amongst the loyal, those existing Jaguar people and new Jag people, who expected something fundamentally very, very different to a Mondeo, which, by the way, is a superb car. I think the, the next generation of cars, kind of the last generation of our current fleets, if you like, where they, they've pushed again to try and get that volume to come in, is with the Jaguar XE and then the I-Pace, so a conventional three series sized car, you could say the new X type and then breaking out into electric cars. And they went reasonably early with the electric car and they came up with a design that was unique. It has got this cab forward design, which gives it a very unique look and uh, all praise to Jag for that it seems to have failed to have ignited the market. There you've got a car which is truly a great electric car, but it was not special enough. It was not different enough. It was not Jaguar enough to really start to churn out the numbers. Plus, the trouble we're going early with the electric cars is things moved on really quickly and things like range the Jaguar is well and truly trounced by later cheaper vehicles which actually ha do have some pretty good looks and a lot of other good features around them and the Jaguar isn't able to lean on a drop dead gorgeous interior to say well that's why we're different and that's why you need it because again they went a bit samey which is where I think the XE has missed the mark as well. They try to go like everybody else. XE and the latest XF have interiors which have impeccable quality in the true sense of the word, build, fit and finish, but do not make you take a second look when you get inside them. Unlike the original XF, with its flippy over air vents and rising 
gear shift selector and the aluminium run through the middle of the dashboard. In almost every trim permutation, the XEs particularly look quite dour, quite dark, very BMW. So in chasing after the volume, I feel that they missed the mark a little. And they lost a little bit of what the Jaguarness is. In fairness, the XE, certainly in the second-hand market, has started to attract a more youthful audience because the prices are keen, the cars drive like Jags should drive sharp, but those interiors are just nice. They're well-built. They don't have the wow. And certainly me, as an older Jag fan, I appreciate those vehicles. I've driven them all. And um, I'm not hankering to buy one. So where is Jag going to go when it finally emerges from its hibernation? It has to be said that they've kind of wound things down in order to re-emerge post being strong on diesel engines to be strong in a new non-fossil fuel environment under new management and new direction and i feel that this is the one last roll of the dice situation they've put so much effort and so much secrecy into their future but it's going to be stellar or it'll all be wrapped up in a couple of years we hear that they're trying to push themselves further up market be seen as the prestige choice and i think that's probably a good move as long as they don't push it too far and go pure exotica where the average person cannot aspire to owning a five six year old example at some point i hope that they're going to go after a similar sort of volume that they would expect from the likes of the XK8. So producing about a hundred thousand examples over the course of eight or nine years is a good target, I think, for a Jaguar-esque company. And again, establishes them as far more volume than your TVRs of past and the older iterations of Aston Martin. But doesn't push them into the BMW and Mercedes department where they're not going to compete very easily either. But I'm looking forward to seeing what they do more than I'm scared of what they're going to do. Their back catalogue of cars is amazing. I've owned so many of them and I'm going to own more of them. And that back catalogue is not going to change. So as a Jag enthusiast, I've still got what I love. And I'm unlikely to buy a brand new Jaguar, regardless of how much it costs in the near future, just because of where I am in, in life. But I do want to see them do well. They're my team. If I was into football in a big way, you know, then I'd be supporting a team and partisan. I am partisan and support Jaguar. I love a lot of other brands for very different reasons, but Jaguar is number one for me. So two other key areas I want to share my thoughts with, with you guys. Um, one is a bit linked to what we just talked about, which is appealing to youth. I feel that the next generation of cars, when they emerge, whether people can afford them or not, have to appeal to today's youth, the people who are learning to drive now need to see the Jaguars and go oh wow how amazing how cool I wish I had one in a way that Jaguar has not always pulled off Jaguars have had an image problem with their younger audiences outside of the XK brand um, because there's always that joke for, oh, you're getting a Jag? 
does it come with the pipe slippers tartan blanket flat cap or do you have to buy them yourself they are seen as older gents cars not useful aspirational cars that men and women of all ages would love to own and to get that right they've got to get their marketing right and they've got to get their styling right and appeal to a younger dem demographic because Jaguar's current fans are aging and we will get topped up by people following in behind us, but it's less and less. So they need to appeal to a young group now that aspire to own that vehicle a few years down the line when it's got a little cheaper. Without that, the Jaguar brand will disappear, in my opinion. It's never going to be a budget brand and we're never going to appeal to youth in that way. But I know when a lot of us were kids, we'd see an E-Type and go, oh, I want one of them. And I did. And to be honest, I was there when they launched the XK8. And I went, oh. um, I was a little older than a kid, but and it stuck with me forever. And no, there was no way I could afford one of those cars until years after they were introduced, I got my first one. We need that effect. Without that effect, you're not building the mystique around the brand, the desirability. And let's face it, a lot of mature people buy a car because they like it, uh, because it does what they need. But they'd also like to be buying a car that they knew lots of other people thought was cool as. Because that in turn means that they must be cool as too. And then the other little hobby horse I want to talk to you about is, I think it's pretty obvious that the next generation that emerges of Jags will be electric. And as a petrol head, obviously, I mourn the loss of our fantastic ice engines. But I am no climate change denier. I know why things need to change. And so it's just something, again, where I'm going to enjoy the back catalogue. For as long as I can if I can drive greener and be greener I will be and am in a lot of regards but I will mourn the loss of those vehicles however whilst Jaguar will inevitably wheel out a range of electric vehicles I hope that they are working on right now the vehicle that comes next or the drivetrain that comes next because personally I do not think that electric battery operated vehicles are the future. They are not as green as their sellers would like us to believe. They are a solution for now in terms of air quality but they're not a long-term solution in terms of the health of our planet because of how we make those batteries, how we dispose of those batteries. And then there's the infrastructure nightmare that charging vehicles creates. Some people are not in a position to charge from home because of the nature of their homes. Many people, me included, because of the way they work, a, an electric vehicle is not practical at the moment because of the number of times I would have to charge. I would typically have to charge twice a day to do what I do, to do my work. And whilst I wouldn't have to charge fully, range anxiety is a real big thing. And the current infrastructure to charge the cars is woefully insufficient and unreliable. But just think for a moment about your average petrol station where you live. How many cars pass through that in the average hour? Filling up with fuel, diesel, petrol. Now take that number and let's imagine it's 100 in an hour, which is not a big number for a petrol station. If all of those vehicles were electric, 
then a good portion of those vehicles would still be rocking up at a garage of some nature every hour. So how big is your petrol station, even if you allow for faster and faster charging, to allow those vehicles not to park for the average of three to four minutes, but they've got to park for 20 minutes to three quarters of an hour, depending on what they're trying to do, and then move off. That doesn't work. We've got to take the assumption that the vast majority of people are going to charge from home. And how is the national grid in the UK particularly going to cope with that? Plus, we're just starting to see the real secondhand values of electric cars. And some of them are quite worrying. They're really crashing even exotic brands like Porsche. Some of the electric vehicles that are now coming into their maybe third owners have got woeful resale values. And without the backup of a really good warranty, do you want to pick up a second-hand, relatively expensive vehicle with a time bomb financially in terms of its battery life? I really think that electric cars are a bit of a stopgap solution for us as a planet. And the next thing to come along will be the one that takes off in the same way as petrol and diesel. I personally think it's probably hydrogen. We've got to work on how we generate that hydrogen. And the main reason for that is we can use similar infrastructure and fill times if we go hydrogen. And if we go hydrogen, we probably can apply it to our commercial fleets easier as well, because whilst all the cars are turning electric, it's gonna be a hell of a long time before you're taking all the buzzies, trucks and vans off the road, where they're doing huge distances every day and multi-drops all day long but batteries just aren't working for so i really really hope that they've got something in the pipeline that means they don't get trapped into being yet another electric car maker and we're see, starting to see a lot of the chinese makers that have sprung up left right and center starting to struggle and to stockpile their cars anyway a lot of it's conjecture and they're just my opinions and thoughts and I'm interested to know for real what you guys as fellow JAG enthusiasts are thinking about the future of JAG. Are you horrified by the idea of it changing hands to a Chinese owner or to any other owner? Are you wanting it to stop with Tata or do you want a British brand name to buy it out? That'd be lovely. But I don't know who they are. Will it be spun off from the Land Rover brand? I think inevitably. What do you guys think? Will they be able to make vehicles that appeal to youth again? Will their volumes drop so far that they become irrelevant? Let me know in the comments below your thoughts on the future of Jaguar as it re-emerges from, I'll call it, hibernation. As for my Jag and many of your Jags, the X100s, XK8s, XKRs, what's going on with them? I think prices have started to rise. And some of that's because the cars have reached that point where badly maintained and badly looked after examples have started to get beyond economic repair which has raised the price of well-maintained and well-looked-after cars. Um, we're starting to see more parts become available rather than less parts become available as specialists start to re-engineer them. The dawn of 3D printing as a normal thing, as bringing back possibilities. And a burgeoning resto mods scene uh, i think 
will pick up rather well on our drop dead gorgeous shaped cars and transplanting things like electric motors into them. The classic car scene, I think, is going through um, a bit of a rebirth at the moment. It's, again, a bit like Jaguar. It's probably gone a little bit dull and samey. I think it's going to re-emerge as a growing scene and bring along with it newer modern classics. There used to be a time, not very long back, when I would almost feel a little embarrassed turning up with my XK8 at a car show. Because despite it being 27 years old, it doesn't look it. And you would see the odd person staring at the car thinking, what's that doing here? They've aged incredibly well and they kind of look out of place in some classic car gatherings. But more and more modern classics are being recognised as such. And I think that's going to give a huge regeneration to the classic car scene, which is no longer pre-war cars, is no longer 60s cars. It's very much the classic car scene, I would say, dominated by 80s and 90s cars, and then there are some really expensive, much older things in the background. So I think we're in for a bit of a um, heyday for the classic car scene moving ahead. And we just happen to own the most beautiful car. You can argue about the E-Type that money can buy or money could buy. But it's getting more and more difficult to get a nice one. Anyway, I'm now going to break off and make myself a little bit of tea, do a little bit of work on the old laptop, ready for tomorrow, and get myself ready for another day out in the field in factories. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.